evening, everybody. <laughs> kind of miss the sharing today. Miss you all a little bit. <coughs> Not really, because you're here. And, uh, I'm enjoying the silence as well. So. Yeah, so... Uh, today I wanted to talk about... Um, some of the so-called obstacles to the practice of metta, loving kindness, which could be considered obstacles to the meditation in general. Um, basically those afflictive states of mind that I really dislike calling hindrances or defilements is even worse. Basically mental states that cause us suffering or emotional states, particularly clinging, aversion, and anything on that spectrum. Resentment, fear, irritation, dissatisfaction, <laughs> all these things that stop us from being really present to what's here right now and having loving kindness towards it. So uh, I was speaking before coming here with someone in this room and uh, they were saying that, yeah, metta is like both a vitamin pill, you know, to prevent this disease of ill will and it's also a cure because obviously we don't all have unconditional loving kindness 24 hours a day, so sometimes we do have to uh, take the cure for our own will. And in the meantime, we get on with the preventative measures, which is the practice that we do. Um, but the whole thing, of course, is a process. And uh, either way, whether you're taking a vitamin or um, you want to find a cure, the reason is because you're actually ill. So rather than seeing the mind that's aversive or angry or full of fear as um, a problem and something to fight and uh, develop more aversion towards, which is called the second arrow in Buddhism, adding ill will to ill will, rather than doing that, we, it's more helpful, I think, to look at ourselves and others as temporarily ill. And that is more likely to arouse feelings of compassion and also a sense of um, searching for a cure. There is a cure, right? If there wasn't, then we'd be in big trouble. But luckily we have this path. And it's going to boost your mental health enormously to free yourself bit by bit from uh, this habit of negativity and fault-finding towards life, towards oneself. Um, and I was reading just recently that when we don't have enough self-care, this really contributes to a decline in mental health. It's obvious, isn't it? You know, when you stay up late, and I do this too much because of work, or when you just get into social media excessively, or when you forget to eat, you feel pretty rubbish. And it is a lack of self-care that then you get more down than usual, more depressed than usual, and you think there's something wrong with you. But actually, a lot of these issues can be solved just by a bit more self-care and love. And that tender concern that you give a friend, you wouldn't just kind of say, right, you carry on working all through the lunch, you don't need to eat, I'll give you a biscuit instead of a meal. You know, that would be really mean and nasty, as they say in the South. Really mean and nasty. So we don't do that. <laughs> but we try and care for ourselves to boost our... Um, protective power of metta and to give ourselves a mental health pill without having to go to any psychiatrist or mental health consultant. Nothing wrong if you need to, but metta, self-care, does a great deal of good. So I wanted to recap on metta and the meaning of loving-kindness in response to someone's question yesterday. Uh, I was thinking about that a bit more, and it is the unconditional kind of love, which is, of course, not fully unconditional unless we're probably fully enlightened. Um, but it is this beautiful sense of love that gives of itself. It gives of itself easily, without demand, without expectation, without control. And it has this aspect of tender concern and also commitment to one's own true welfare to one's own and others true welfare so of course that involves knowing what that true welfare really is um, not necessary that you have to do very much but at least to wish for that person's highest happiness real genuine happiness and there's a sense of uh, loving kindness that is enduring it doesn't change so much when the object of love changes 
it, it stays stable, steady, committed to caring. And the other really important aspect is its pervasive nature, that it's not just to me and mine, but it's to all beings. Like the sun shines its warmth onto all, loving kindness radiates and spreads to all beings, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, etc., etc., even regardless of what other people have done to us. And this is where, you know, we have to work on our anger and ill will to unblock the possibility, to unleash the possibility of having loving kindness to all. But again and again in the suttas, although the Buddha doesn't really define loving kindness in a nutshell, the special feature that he points to is the fact that loving kindness is almost a result of overcoming ill will. So it has this beautiful ethical quality about it. And to the degree that one has loving kindness, those afflictive states won't arise. Yeah. So it's actually a, a cure in that sense. But of course, for most of us, it's the opposite. It's, you know, the, the opposite side is that the more loving, the more we overcome our ill will and the more we remove the obstacles to loving kindness, the things that constrict the heart and that um, cause us to kind of close up or shut down then the more loving kindness is available to us and the more it can flow, the further it can spread. So the Buddha time and again talks about anger as one of the poisons of the mind, of the heart, and uh, there's a very famous Dhammapada verse, I've checked it out, it's in the first chapter, between number three and number five, verse three to five of the first chapter, and it's that beautiful verse which everyone should understand and obviously most nations don't, most political leaders don't, <laughs> but hatred is never, it says appeased, but I don't quite like that word. Let's say hatred never ceases through hatred, through love alone hatred ceases, because there is an actual end to, cease, to, to hatred, it can actually cease. But obviously if we you know, respond to hate with hate, if we respond to weapons with more weapons, bigger weapons, stronger weapons, more defence, you know, in the name of defence, then the wars are never going to end. So love is the only way. And this is what the Buddha teaches time and again. So, yeah, there's this other phrase in that same uh, part of the verse. They robbed me, they abused me, they struck me, they overcame me. And the Buddha says, you know, one that harbours those kind of thoughts is only going to increase hatred in the mind. So we have to become the master of our minds or the mistress, whatever, of our minds. You know, if we let these kind of thoughts roll, then, of course, we're going to seek revenge. So it's easy to be kind and compassionate and loving to people that are pleasant to us. But what do we do in our lives when maybe people don't try and start a war with us, but maybe uh, they are like unreasonably unfriendly. We think it's unreasonable, you know, or maybe we're kind to someone and they don't return the kindness back. Maybe they even take advantage or manipulate us because they think we're a soft touch. Have you ever had that? <laughs> it happens, right? And what, what's the answer? Do you stop being a soft touch, so to speak, and stop trusting others? Or do you still love and risk that manipulation that people might take advantage of you? Um, again, wisdom has to be involved, and I'm not going to answer my own question now, because that's a big topic that could perhaps come in questions. But, um, you know, basically most of the time people don't uh, behave the way we expect or the way we'd like them to. And what do we do about that? You know, we can't avoid everybody that we don't like. We have to work with them. We have to live with them sometimes. So I wanted to go through a few of the uh, ways that are discussed in the suttas about how to deal with this. And uh, one of the first ways that is actually in the Majjhima Nikaya, it's one of the um, main texts in the Pali Canon, it's uh, the number nine called Effacement. And uh, in there, the Buddha's really recommending a kind of kindly restraint, recognizing that some behaviors are inherently harmful and hurtful. And rather than condemning another person, simply determining not to do the same. 
So I know it goes through a list of so many different uh, tendencies that show you that beings in the time of the Buddha were just like us. <laughs> it says, for example, oh, others will be angry, we will not be angry here. Others will be resentful, we will not be, ang- we will not be resentful here. Others will be covetous, we shall not be covetous. Others shall be miserly, we shall not be miserly. Others will be non-celibate, we shall be celibate. You don't have to be if you're a lay person, but for monastics that's certainly important, otherwise you'd be kicked out of the monastic uh, order. So it's rather than you know using those people as kind of fuel for our inner hate in a way and to wind us up we look at other people's mistakes and we learn from them you know okay they've committed those mistakes and I can see how that harms me it harms others so what about if I determine not to do the same so even bad examples can be good examples to learn from that's what I found in my life you know even if say I'm in a monastery or I'm a nun, so usually I'm in a monastery (laughs) or in a community that I feel doesn't really do things the way that I like or the way that I think is wise and helpful. Instead of condemning that, I can say, great, you know, they're showing me what not to do. And I can endeavor to, to bring more kindness to the way I relate or more democracy or more inclusion in the way I um, form community. And, of course, it's very humbling to find that often we try to do better and we can't, right? (laughs) Because we forget that other people do things that are unskillful because of their own conditioning, you know? They're actually, in a sense, victims to that, slaves to their own habits of the mind. So it can be very humbling, but at least we exercise this kind of restraint and a kind of determination not to do the same. And even though it might sound a little bit... I don't know, like you read these long lists of all these various defilements or hindrances that people have in their mind, you think, okay, this is obvious, we shouldn't do that. But just reading it seems very empowering to me. Others will be selfish, I shall be selfless, or we will not be selfish here. Others will be jealous, we shall not be jealous here. It's just very nice to think that that's a possibility. And so that's the first uh, thing that I wanted to share. There's a few different ways to uh, overcome resentment. And that's the first, to just protect and restrain the mind. And then the second is um, to change our perceptual framework. So to look at a situation or a person in a different way. I already gave the example of a sick person being, um, uh, sorry, an angry person being uh, sick being ill, being unwell, even being out of their mind. You know, sometimes we could think of them as a mad person, temporary insanity, they've lost their way. And um, that hopefully can engender a compassionate response because it's not always easy to have metta to somebody who's doing a lot of harm or who's hurt us, but we can have a sense of compassion. And if that doesn't work, maybe a sense of equanimity, you know, realising that you can't change other people, um, and you are in your life going to experience you know, people who are pleasant and people who are cruel. But if we can sort of see the bigger perspective and maybe reflect on the blessings of our life, the places people are kind and the friends that we have, then we can have a sense of equanimity to those more difficult situations. And there's a few other um, interesting things the Buddha says. He actually says in some cases to ignore the person, which I think is really nice in that it gives us permission to move ourselves away from some situations that are damaging for us you know situations in my life for example where somebody has behaved in such a way that it's left a lasting trauma in my mind and to bring them to mind even with loving kindness or compassion is re-traumatizing and in that case at one point I had to do this I actually had to kind of not bring that person to mind and not include them in my meta for a couple of years um, just so that I wouldn't have to relive the experience that had really shaken the ground, shaken my sense of like what this world is about because in my mind friends just don't abuse you, like physically abuse you. <laughs> it was really, it took the ground from under me because you know, one of the best relationships I've had in my life has been with friends. And I always felt I had very healthy, very strong, lasting friendships. So the idea this could happen really uh, shook my world. 
And so I did, in a sense, not through ill will, but through a sense of self-protection, just put that person to one side. And they would try to write to me, but never acknowledging what had happened. <laughs> and I just didn't want to hear you know, from this person because they weren't addressing the issue. So I wouldn't really... Um, after a while, they stopped writing. So I ignored the letters. That was the first thing. But then I just ignored them by not bringing them to mind. And it was amazing that after a couple of years when I was really resourced through practicing loving-kindness to a very dear friend, that this person just jumped into my mind all on their own at the right time, and they just melted into the flow without any impact and with no particular impression. They were there for a while, and after a while they disappeared, and I didn't have to um, bring them back, I didn't have to push them out, they just came up in my mind and from then on I could think of them without being triggered. So in that sense it was a very interesting lesson to realise that metta has its own wisdom and when it's the right time you can forgive, you can overcome even the most you know, distressing of hurts that have been done to you. So sometimes ignoring is sensible for a while. My own teacher Adrian Brown says you can love the tiger from a distance. I mean I still haven't seen this person so... <laughs> And sometimes I've thought, should I, should I not, you know, make contact? But after reflecting, I thought, is there really any benefit to me in doing that? And I realised, not really, because our lives have both changed. There's no hatred in my heart. I actually feel very grateful for the friendship that we had. And I can love that person from a distance, you know. I don't even intentionally send meta, but if I think of them, I do know that I wish them well. You know, I do wish that they will... Um, heal from the traumas that they've been through. So uh, this is really lovely. And the other one that the Buddha talks about is applying the idea of karma, cause and effect, to a situation. Beings are the owners of their karma, heir to their karma, abide supported by their karma. Whatever karma they shall do, for good or for ill, of that they shall be the heir. And these are the words of the Buddha directly. This is the same for us, of course, right? So, But we can't work out other people's karma for them. Karma is something that's created in the mind. So how can we influence someone else's karma other than by setting a good example, by working on ourselves? So we can take care of our own karma by generating the beautiful right intentions of loving kindness and gentleness. And Gentleness also, part of being gentle might be having that distance, right? And uh, protecting yourself, surrounding yourself with good friends. And also letting things go. Sometimes letting things go, there's another step before you can let go, which is letting things be, accepting the situation, accepting that this happened, you know, it wasn't uh, ideal. Maybe we could have both done things differently, but this has happened, and now the best karma I can make is to just accept it, let it be, and be kind to the situation. Sometimes I say meta to situations. You know, sometimes we're averse to certain incidences or situations, even the weather can be a cause for like a lot of distress, can't it? Especially for those who live in England. <laughs> I don't know about Norway, maybe, because it snows a lot. I was there last year at the end of April and it was there were blizzards basically for a whole uh, six days of the seven-day retreat, so we couldn't go walking. And sometimes when we did go walking, I went a little way, just a very little way, and uh, what I thought was a path was actually a lake. <laughs> <laughs> that was melting <laughs> so I put my foot in a little bit but not too much so you know there can be treacherous conditions in our lives whether it's the weather or I don't know even someone not showing up on time for the morning work or maybe you hurt your hand and you couldn't chop the logs this morning or you know rake the leaves and uh, sometimes we can have meta to the situation we don't have to get upset that's life it happens and it's not personal Right? It doesn't belong to you. No situation is under our control. So when we learn to look at things in these ways, we have this kind of shift in perception, a little bit more perspective, um, a little bit more fluidity, and also, I would say, some trust, you know, because we can't always work things out the way we want to, when we want to, through just blasting people with love and kindness. Sometimes things take time. And, you know, we have to trust sometimes our intention to forgive. We can't forgive everybody all at once, but we can make the intention to develop forgiveness and give that forgiveness time. 
So the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, how to see the good side of others and also the good side in ourselves. But this is particularly about others. And there's this lovely sutta in the Anguttara's. I did write the note where I can barely read my notes. Anguttara 5162, I think it is. Um, and it's called Removing Resentment. So this is like a really key sutta, one of the most detailed on how to remove resentment that has arisen. And uh, and there's all these beautiful similes that the Buddha uses related to water mostly. The first one's related to a rag on the street. So you have to remember that in ancient India, people, monastics especially, wore robes made out of rags. So this is why we have the lines on our robes. You see these lines? All these little kind of, we call them paddy fields because they're actually made in the shape of a sort of paddy fields. I think so that you can't get fake ascetics who just make their own robes because we still use the same patterns they used in those days. But the point of the sort of strips is that they were actually all separate pieces. And I sewed a big outer robe for my full ordination that was separate pieces. It took months. I was going to say hours. It took months. Mm -hmm. There were four of them on the go, four of us ordaining together. So we had four, and there were double-sized robes, so two robes stitched back to back for each of us. And they're all individual pieces. But anyway... To make these robes from pieces, people used to go in the street and just collect rags, especially the really austere monastics, rag robe wearers or charnel robe wearers. Charnel ground robe wearers, they'd take the old stuff from the dead bodies in the charnel ground and then dye it and make it, kind of stitch it up with the other rags. So this is not from the charnel ground, don't, don't, don't worry. <laughs> I'm not that freaky. So anyway, in this simile, the first one is that a person is uh, impure by body, but pure in speech. So these are just examples, but it's quite interesting because there are people like this, if you think about it. Like their bodily behaviour is really off. Maybe they're really cruel, etc. But their speech is still sometimes okay, sometimes it even might bring people together, sometimes they make sense, you know, they're not only doing terrible things in their life, um, they also have the capacity to, yeah, show support through kind words, for example, so the Buddha says it's like you see this dirty old rag on the street, and you want to make a robe, but it's really filthy. So what you do is you stand on it with one foot, and then you kind of rip off the good part with the other foot, and then you reach down and you kind of gingerly pick it up. And then you take that bit of rag, you wash it, you clean it, you dye it, and you can make a robe. So in the same way, we're doing this for our own mind, to keep our own mind healthy. We look at that person's good part, good side, and we see what we can do with that. You know, maybe we can engage with their good speech. Maybe we can encourage them to continue having good speech. Maybe we can just ignore the other stuff or even use good speech to gently tell them about it, you know, gently tell them when you do this, then I feel like this and, you know, I'm really worried about that. It brings up concern in me. So we can engage with the side that is reasonable and sometimes focus on that. And there's a, it's common to understand this in psychology, that what you focus on tends to grow in a person. Like if you're focusing on the faults, if you already have this idea that a person's full of faults, then whenever you see them, you'll just exaggerate those faults and hone in on them so that person also feels that's all they are. You know, If you don't see their potential, they find it hard to see their, the potential for themselves. But if we can relate to some part of the person you know, that's good, then it will encourage that to grow. I think it was Thich Nhat Hanh who first said, wasn't it, who coined the phrase of watering the flowers and not the weeds, and Ajahn Brahm kind of took it over later. <laughs> <laughs> I guess these things belong to no one, but I think that was a very typical Thich Nhat Hanh teaching, and he would have known what he was talking about having gone through what he did. So he was Vietnamese, and I mean, you would know more than me, but I think he got Nobel, he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, wasn't he? Yeah, by Dr. King. Sorry, by, by Luther Dr. King, yeah, Martin Luther King, yeah, yeah. So he knew how to make peace and promote harmony, and he always said you have to water the flowers and watch them grow, 
And sometimes Ajahn Brahm extends that. He says if you just starve the weeds or if you just don't water them, they'll wither away by themselves because the flowers will overtake them, whether or not that's true, really, in gardening or not. But you can see the analogy there. So then the next simile is that somebody's um, verbal action is impure, but their bodily action is pure. And I was trying to find a new simile for this, but it's one that I've drawn on before, and it's the best I can find. It was when I was working in a care home many years ago. It was my last job, 2001. Yeah. <laughs> well, I shouldn't say it's my last job. I got a, big, I got a lot of jobs now, <laughs> a lot. But um, that was my last so-called paid job. I mean, it's like 3.60 an hour or something to look after people in an, uh, what do they call it? In, that, in those days, they called it elderly, mentally infirm. So it was people in the last sort of stage of Alzheimer's before they would really require one-to-one care, which I think they did even then. Um, so the conditions were very, very tough. We had about 40 people to care for and only about six or seven staff. Sometimes a couple were missing on a shift and we had to take care of everyone. And there was this one woman who was a very rough, working-class, coarse, coarsely spoken person. F in this and F in that and... <laughs> <laughs> very, very harsh speech. And at first I was a bit, ooh, you know, I'm not quite used to that. And then after a while I got to know her. She was quite an amazing person. She said she could earn more working at the local checkout in the supermarket, but she wanted to be there because if she wasn't, who would care for these people? And you could see the love, and you could see her dedication, especially on the night shifts, you know, when we'd go around to the rooms and she'd march in and oh, people were doing, you know, terrible things in the sense that their personal hygiene... I mean, they didn't know what they were doing by then. The dementia was in such a late stage. So you'd find feces all over the place and... She'd just get right in there without any concern and clean them up and make everything shine and, you know, strip the sheets however many times a night. And she was just so dedicated to the job. And that became a great example for me of, you know, looking at what actually a person does rather than what they say. Because sometimes people's speech is, is terrible. And sometimes it's just bravado, you know, it's just kind of rhetoric. But, I mean, sometimes it's not, right? Sometimes the, the bodily um, action is bad as well. But sometimes what they're actually doing for others shows their true character. And it's that that we can really dwell on and, and reflect on to remove any resentment that may have arisen there. So uh, the Buddha says that's like, um, which one is that? That's like algae on a pond. So the algae is grown over the pond, that's the bad verbal speech. So you can just move it aside with your hands and then you can drink from the pond. But in the next one, the next example, and I'm sure we know people like this as well, hopefully not many of them, but maybe we see them on the TV, whose verbal and bodily speech is impure. And the Buddha said that's like a puddle. <laughs> you want to drink, right, to quench your own resentment, you want to drink, but you see this muddy puddle. And the only thing you can do, sometimes there's water in there that can be drunk because sometimes this person has like some clarity of mind, he says. So what you do with this puddle is you get down on all fours so that you don't stir it up more and then with cupped hands you drink a little bit of water from there. So in this way we can quench our resentment, quench our thirst. But it's more difficult. So we have to get pretty close and we have to get close at a time that's safe to get close and we have to look pretty carefully for the good qualities in that person, but still we make the effort to do that. And uh, the next one is somebody who um, has impure verbal and bodily speech, no, verbal speech and bodily action, um, and doesn't get any clarity of mind. They don't gain an opening of the mind, it says in here. So it means their mind is always full of hate and terrible qualities, you know, there's really not a lot of hope for them. And this one is the one who the Buddha says we have to see them and regard them as being gravely sick, gravely afflicted, without medicine, without an attendant. And we have to wish, with sheer tender concern, may this person recover from their sickness. May this person get the food and the medical care that they need. May they stop doing things that are for their harm and may they uh, instead develop skillful actions and speech. So compassion is really the way to regard such a person, regard them as ill. They've lost their mind, they're on the wrong track, 
and they can't really imagine the harm and the bad karma that they're creating through what they're doing. Sometimes we can see the world and we think, how come these people seem to get ahead? But this is just, we're seeing a snapshot of samsara, a snapshot of a person's life. And sometimes you see, I don't know, it's not nice to mention names, but a particular politician, when you look really at their face, there's something dead inside. There's something in those eyes that just have no brightness, no joy. And really, it's, it's tragic, because not only are they ruining their own life, they're ruining the lives of many others. And they're ruining their lives to come, you know, whether or not you believe in that. But, you know, it's logical that if you're on a particular negative track, it's only going to continue. The Buddha says, you know, whatever we, however we frequently think and reflect, that becomes the inclination of our mind. So if we've just cultivated hate and delusion and greed, you know, it's, it's only going to continue. It's going to be very, very hard to turn it around. Somebody mentioned yesterday that simile, and Ajahn Pramali's used it too, of a big heavyweight tanker. There's something like 500,000 tons, I think, half a million tons, and they're going, 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 you know, along a course for, I don't know, days, months, in a straight line. And if you want to turn those things around, it takes a huge amount of effort. It can take many miles before they start to actually turn and, and change the direction. In the meantime, they might have hit an iceberg or whatever. So, you know, it's really, really difficult with people like this. And um, compassion is the most appropriate response to help ourselves from developing anger and hate. And then the last one is interesting because the last one is a person who is pure in body and in speech. And this is still included in a person we have to overcome resentment toward. So I don't know about anyone here. Have you ever had resentment towards someone who's really pure in body and speech? Thanks for the honesty, yeah. Because this is what you call jealousy, isn't it? Sometimes it's jealousy. Or sometimes maybe it is resentment. Maybe you don't believe it. Maybe you think they're a fake, you know. (laughs) Or you've seen something that you disagree with and you can't really understand why other people follow them. But even the Buddha had enemies. I mean, most of the time it's true that there's a lot of fake gurus and things like that, but, you know, and and what we see as as virtue, we can't be so sure unless we really know a person for a long period of time. But um, even the Buddha, his own cousin turned against him out of jealousy and did something that on the surface looked very good. He sort of said, oh, the Sangha, the monks and nuns should all be vegetarian because this is better than the Sangha eating meat. And he actually managed to gain a lot of followers, and he had deep meditation at first. But after a while, because of his hate for the Buddha and trying to... He actually did draw the Buddha's own blood by rolling a rock towards the Buddha and trying to kill him. But luckily only a, a splinter got in the Buddha's foot. But still, it's a very bad thing to draw the blood of a Buddha so be careful you never do it. <laughs> it's not a lot of chance. <laughs> um, so, and for that, he apparently went to a very low realm and suffered for a long time there. So even he had resentment to the Buddha, um, even though the Buddha is such a pure person. So what we can do here, because we are actually really, uh, I think this is one of the dangerous ones, is to have resentment towards someone who's actually pure, because... The Buddha says the whole of the spiritual life is having wise companionship, a wise spiritual friend. And there's no greater spiritual friend than the Buddha or somebody who's really purifying their their mind. So if we have resentment rather than inspiration or confidence, then we're denying ourselves the opportunity to have such a spiritual friend. So instead of jealousy, instead of resentment, why don't we actually realize that this person is like a beautiful tree offering so much shade and protection and instead of you know feeling like oh it's not fair I'm not like that go and sit in the shade you know have that humility to say there's something that maybe they've cultivated that I've yet to learn maybe I can learn something here and then that inspiration becomes a cause for confidence and if you have confidence then the path opens up So many times in the suttas, the path starts with confidence, hearing the teachings and having confidence in them, a confidence that inspires you to take steps on the path. So this is how we overcome resentment to the pure person. 
And uh, what else? There was a lot of things I wanted to say. I hope it won't be too much, but um, <laughs> are you all okay so far? Because I'm really enthusiastic about it. <laughs> There's also the question of a resentment to ourself, right? And I'm going to go over it fairly briefly because we're already practicing meta. But uh, the two main things that I think can help with this are, of course, self-compassion and then forgiveness as well. And I guess patience comes in both of those, but self-compassion is so important. And again, to just, you know, maybe we're not really sick, but maybe there are feelings that we find difficult to be with. And instead of kind of resisting those, what about asking ourselves, how can I care for this feeling right now? And just have some self-compassion. And um, most of you might know about Kristen Neff. I think the book by her colleague, what's his name, Christopher Germer, is in all our rooms. And he also kind of followed up on this um, research into self-compassion. And uh, usually I like to go straight with the Buddha's words, but, I mean, it does relate really well. And she found out that um, self-compassion is almost like an antidote to judgment. It's the opposite in a way. Because self-compassion means we understand that there is a cause, there are causes and conditions that have produced whatever it is we're experiencing right now. It's not personal. There's no need to judge it because it's here, it's arrived. So if we understand how these things have arrived and that often these causes and conditions are completely outside our control, then we can have a little bit more compassion. And the emphasis becomes trying to um, change the causes and conditions of our lives, maybe things that have led us to make a mistake or to be in a difficult relationship, try and learn from that and change the causes and conditions that we're in rather than trying to change the imaginary self. So we don't have to fix ourselves; we just have to put ourselves in conditions where we can thrive. And then the other aspect of that was um, to reflect on our shared humanity, common humanity, rather than becoming isolated and over-identified with our lives. Um, and this is really important. And one of the things I learned, really valuable learning, from about 10 years of practice in the Goenka centres, was that every human being from every walk of life, this was mainly Indian people, but people from all over the world would come to these retreats. And within India itself, there was so much diversity of the people that would come. I mean, there's like... I think 40 major languages and about 400 plus fairly major language, fairly next major. There must be thousands of languages in that country. And there would be people coming from like the Jain monks and nuns. There would be Christian priests. There would be um, illiterate women from a small village in Gujarat or in Maharata. We did retreats in hospitals for the blind in illiterate areas. <laughs> There were rich Indians from Bombay, there were movie stars, there was just every kind of person there, and in big numbers. And I would be serving these retreats in India, Nepal, all over the world, actually. And what I noticed is in any 10-day retreat, when a person has to sit with their own body and mind, they would go through a certain range of emotions and experiences, no matter who they were. <laughs> and these would be common to all of us. And even without language, I could understand. We could relate. I was managing most of the retreats. And um, it didn't matter if we didn't speak the same language because we'd just get it. And it was very interesting that it would go through a pattern as well, depending on which day it was. <laughs> and on some retreats, it was really interesting, there'd be a particular theme. So on some retreats at the end, people would say, oh, on around day whatever, I had a lot of anger coming up. I don't normally have anger. Oh, really? Me too. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, same. I was thinking, that's really strange. I don't normally get anger coming up. And there'd be a kind of energy that the group would, I don't know, what's it, resonate with, tune up with, and you'd go through similar things, no matter where you were from, you know. And I found this so fascinating. What it showed me is that we're really not so unique we really, our own personal struggles are not such a big deal. Everyone's either going through it, has been through it, or will go through it at some time in their life. And it really depersonalised the process for me. Because what can happen if you just give your whole life to the practice, it becomes like your vocation, your passion, your 
reason to live. So progress can become quite important and we can become a little bit over-obsessed with my progress, which is actually quite ugly and quite egotistical. And I would find that if I was ever sort of thinking, "Mm, I don't know, maybe it's not going anywhere or, you know, maybe I'm getting too into it and losing perspective, I'd think, right, serve, serve a retreat or two. So I'd always alternate the serving and the sitting and I realised, wow, you know, we're all in this together completely. And that was very helpful. And the other thing that that, that Dr. Kristen Neff noticed is um, uh, how isolation also... Uh, exacerbates a lack of self-compassion. So not just forgetting our common humanity, but also um, isolation and how that also can make us over-identified with our lives. And I think this is something we probably all went through a little bit with the COVID, or a lot. It was actually a big deal at the time. I was on my own for about two years without anyone coming to the monastery. And for the first year, it was wonderful. I love solitude, so I was in seventh heaven. It was... And also I found I had tons of gratitude to the fact that I had a roof, I had running water, I was able to teach the Dhamma on Zoom and my people who were attending would send me shopping every week. Basically I was covered, like they would just feed me the whole time. I had to cook, which is kind of against my monastic rules, but I still had um, everything I needed compared to the reports I was hearing on the TV about, especially in India, people having to go back on foot to their villages because these horrible companies in the city just sent them home without anything, without water, food for the journey. And I'm sure no COVID testing. And even when the test came, they had to pay. You know, it was just horrible. This rich-poor divide was even bigger than usual, I guess. Or let's say impactful, because when there's disease, it really shows. So, uh, you know, I just felt grateful and I tried to use uh, my privilege well. But still, even though I had, you know, this online community, by the second year I was struggling and my nervous system was getting out of whack because we need one another to regulate, to self-regulate. And this is neurological. Like I've read a lot about that since. Polyvagal theory. And um, there are ways you can get it back in, in line, but it's... The easiest way is to sit with a friend or somebody with a very well-adjusted nervous system, and there was no one there for me. So I'd have my teacher, you know, on on Skype once a week or, or less, usually once a week. He was absolutely brilliant. But still, after a while, it just felt like a computer. It, I was really missing that um, human touch, as in human energy. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if other people experience this, but... Um, when I did start to meet people again, I, I couldn't quite believe they were real. It felt like they were <laughs> on a screen. It's like, are you real? Like, I can touch you and you're not real. <laughs> it was really weird. I realised that I'd lost some kind of empathetic resonance and it took some time to get it back. You know, it took the hugs. It took kind of really sitting there, having tea together, talking. <laughs> Kareem's laughing because we were having tea, lots of tea. <laughs> yeah. But it really took time to get readjusted for me because, you know, that long without any human being around is very alien to what we are as animals, relational beings. So this also um, is an important part of caring for ourselves. And then the forgiveness. And forgiveness starts with acknowledging if we've done something we wish we hadn't. um, Acknowledging and accepting that. Again, seeing the causes that led to it and finding a way to give ourselves a better chance next time. Yeah. And forgiveness is a process. So one of the phrases I sometimes like to use is, um, may, I, may I, how is it? May I commit to the process of forgiveness? Or may another person even know that I intend to forgive? May they know I intend to forgive? So we have the intention. We don't have to actually do it all at once. It's impossible. Everything has to be gradual in the Buddha's path. And that can be a beautiful gift of self-compassion. You know, everybody makes mistakes. My teacher loves it when people mis- make mistakes. 
he thinks it's funny. <laughs> and he sometimes makes mistakes on purpose to give other people permission to as well. Like he lets his robe hang off all the time. It's ridiculous. It's like a wedding robe at the back. It falls right down. And then it's like a train behind him. It's kind of scary if you're following him up some stairs because you think he's going to trip. But, <laughs> but it makes everybody relax and not be so uptight about how they appear. Because in monastic life, there, there can be a lot of uh, formality and uh, it's good to loosen up a bit, to get some spillage and whatever on your robe and to, I don't know, <laughs> just be a normal person because that's all we are. We just This is a sign that we're in a certain training system, but it's not a sign that we're already there, you know. We're just human beings like everyone else. And uh, yes, there are only 10 minutes left, and I hope it won't be too much, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about thought. Is that good? To do that as well? Yeah? I'm not losing you. Just taking what's helpful. But um, obviously a lot of our resentment comes up in the form of thought, or a lot of the negative emotions are articulated as thought. Not only that, but thought can create emotions. So if we tend to dwell on a particular style of thinking, then it's going to exacerbate depression or anxiety or uh, fear, etc., etc. The opposite is also true. So the Buddha said when he was still um, training, when he wasn't yet enlightened, he noticed that in his mind there were two kinds of thought, roughly speaking. And he managed to divide them into these two categories. So on the one side, he had the thoughts that were based on greed. Even the Buddha had greed, lust. Even the Buddha had desire, pre-Buddha, pre-Buddha. Mm-hmm. This is before he was enlightened. Uh, and he had thoughts of um, being possessive about things. He had thoughts of ill will and he had thoughts of cruelty. But on the other side, he noticed that he had thoughts of non-ill will. He had thoughts of non-lust, of letting go. And he had thoughts of harmlessness. And they're exactly the same as the second factor of the path, the three right intentions, thoughts of loving kindness, non-cruelty, and letting go, or renunciation. So he saw that there were these two types of thought, and he said, these afflictive thoughts, I've written it down here till I get the words right, um, he recognized that they lead to his own and others' affliction. They obstruct wisdom cause difficulties, and lead away from Nibbāna. Yeah? So they create affliction for oneself and others. They obstruct wisdom, cause difficulties, and lead away from Nibbāna. And just reflecting in this way, just recognising that, was enough for him to let them go, to abandon them. And I'm sure there are a lot of steps in between, but sometimes all we have to do is see the problem, realise it's not taking us the direction we want to go. In the Buddhist text, there's this phrase that the monks and nuns say sometimes when they see this kind of thing. They say, I know you, Mara. Mara is this like uh, Buddhist idea of the devil, I suppose, that gets inside our minds. It's a personification of like unwholesome states. And they want to, and the, this Mara wants to keep us away from enlightenment. So when we see these things coming up, we just say, I know you, Mara. And the minute that they're seen, they just disappear. And sometimes this can happen straight away. You see a thought, you realise this is not where I want to go, and you just drop it and you go a different route. So on the other hand, he saw that these other states, the uh, thoughts of loving kindness and uh, non-cruelty, non-ill will, and letting go, renunciation, they actually led towards Nibbāna. They didn't create difficulties or obstructions or lead to anybody's affliction. And then he found out that if he thought about these things the positive things, even for a whole day and night, that he didn't have anything to fear. And it's important to say this, because this is what we're doing in the loving-kindness practice, if we are using thought. Or if you feel that, you know, you're not able to feel loving-kindness, you can still use thought. It isn't, uh, it isn't, what's the word? It has a function. You might think it's just words, it doesn't mean anything, you're not feeling it. But it is protecting your mind because it's keeping you on track towards wholesome thoughts. There'll be times that the thoughts become very genuine, even if at first they feel a little bit automated, like a a robot, may I be happy, may I be. (laughs) (laughs) 
but still, you're keeping yeah. these positive thoughts and, and intentions going in your mind. So he said the only thing that is an issue there is that after a while the thoughts will tire your body because a lot of thinking drains the energy from the brain, from the body, and then the mind will be not able to settle fully. So when he noticed that, then he was able to still those thoughts and bring them to quietness and bring the mind to oneness, bring the mind to a state of samadhi. But this is a gradual process. So at first we have to get on the right track and then over time we can lengthen the gaps between the phrases. We can allow the mind to sink in to the experience of wholesome states or whatever it is, to be with the breath in a non-verbal way, to be with sensations, experiences, just with the right intention and, uh, and to develop insight in our practice because we're on the right track. And then if an unwholesome thought comes off and we can see it clearly enough to let it go pretty, cl- pretty quickly. And the other thing he said was that there are different ways to overcome thoughts in order to clear the mind completely so that we do have the possibility of experiencing deep states of stillness. And in that, sometimes they're referred to as the higher mind. Um, so there's this sutta, which is the way of removing thought to achieve the higher mind, the adhichitta, which means deep states of samadhi. And the first one, the first way of doing this, is to basically replace an unwholesome thought with a wholesome thought. And he says this is like using a coarse peg to, uh, is it? No, a fine peg to remove a coarse peg. So if you imagine like, I don't know, something held together with a peg, a little wooden peg, and you want to remove the coarse one, which is the unwholesome thought, you use a fine one. So there's still something there, but you're substituting something grosser with something subtler. And then another one is to see the danger in the unwholesome thoughts. You know, we said already that they might lead to affliction, they might lead to bad habits in the mind or negative emotions arising. But sometimes having any thought at all is a danger in the sense that you're not able to appreciate the silence. So sometimes we can get a taste for the silence instead of the thinking mind. Another way is to just ignore the thought. This is actually quite a good way because the mind doesn't have to be completely quiet to get on with the practice. Sometimes the kind of mental chatter can be there but you just let it be in the background. You don't give it much attention. You keep going with your main meditation object. Or you just kind of let it fall off the screen. Sometimes it fades to be this like white noise. They're not really proper thoughts, so it's just kind of a... <laughs> Does anyone else have that? Because I often have a kind of little... <laughs> just something, like a sort of mini earworm. It's not even a tune. It's just something to kind of create this feeling of white noise that, like, I'm still there. Some part of me is still there. Because <laughs> we're sometimes scared of letting go, and that can take some time to subside. But just ignore it and carry on, and eventually it disappears when you're not even looking. And then we can also just um, learn to still whatever sankara, whatever kind of motivation is behind the thought, especially if it's something like greed and hate and something negative, or even just interest in the thought. We can just kind of nip it in the bud, we can see it arising and before it even becomes a thought, we notice it and it vanishes. I don't know if you've ever had that, when the thought's about to bubble and you sort of see it, but your mind wants to stay maybe with the breath or with the silence and it just kind of disappears again. And uh, yeah, I think we're nearly out of time, but that's, that's, these things are in sequence, so... It's really important to get a sense of how to work with thought in a skillful way. And I remember in my own practice, we didn't really do that very much. Like in the Vipassana tradition taught by Goenkaji, there wasn't a lot of um, instruction on how to work with thought. So a lot of the time we just ignored them and they kind of were there in the background and maybe eventually they'd disappear. But what do you do when you really have an afflictive thought pattern? The Buddha does say, you know, use these... Uh, methods in sequence so don't just tolerate an unskillful thought actually know that you have the choice to replace it with something more wholesome and this is one way that we can really start to incline our mind so that the result the buddha says is that we actually 
get to the point where we can think only the thoughts we want to think and we don't think the thoughts that we don't want to think. Which is an incredible idea, isn't it? If you could have only the thoughts you actually found were helpful, wholesome, ennobling, and you didn't have these random, disturbing thoughts, a lot of suffering would drop away. So this is one really great way to overcome resentment. And I, there was a whole other chunk I wanted to talk about, about emotions, but I usually overestimate how much time we have. So lastly, instead of that, and I think more aligned with the retreat anyway, I just want to encourage you again to use the power of perception when you're dealing with any mental object, whether it's a pleasant, unpleasant, wholesome, unwholesome, whether it's an emotion that you'd rather not be feeling, that's difficult, that may be heavy or sadness. Whatever it is, you can always change your attitude. You can make peace with it. You can be kind to it. You can be gentle with it. Yeah. And what actually happens there is that if you observe something with peace, after a while, your overriding experience is one of peace. Whatever is coming up. Because the mind has power and the intention suffuses the object with its own qualities. So that what you actually start to experience is that peace. The same way we can suffuse something with loving kindness, with warmth. It doesn't mean, like when I say suffuse, I sometimes wonder, does it sound as if we have to like really hard blast it, you know. It can be just very gentle, just kind of gently surround it with a sense of softness, kindness, warmth. It's a subtle shift in the mind. And when we develop love towards something, we end up experiencing love. It's like the mind is so powerful, we can create. It creates an experience in line with itself. We create our world, literally. So when we love, we become loving. When we're kind, we become kind people. It becomes our character. So from attitude to experience... To character, you know, we actually tra- we start to transform our mind, transform our actions of body and speech as well. And it is a process, but this is what's meant by creating good karma. You know, you're creating um, skillful ways of relating and responding to the world, the world outside, the world inside. And this is what we mean by transforming suffering into happiness. You know, this is the path. We have suffering. It doesn't matter what we have. The raw material is not the point. You know, the Buddha said suffering has to be understood, so it's not a bad thing when we experience it. It's a chance to understand it. And when we have kindness in our mind, when we have peace in our mind alongside that suffering, we allow the suffering to be there, but we look at it with new eyes. And that suffering slowly transforms. And whilst it's transforming, we learn. If we just try to transcend it, if we just try to bypass it, or get rid of it, we don't have the chance to learn. But if we can hold it there in our mind with good intention for as long as it takes, just like you'd hold a child who's crying, you hold it until it settles, then you learn what is the nature of sadness, what is the nature of grief. And in the meantime, the mind becomes wise. So this is a very beautiful way to practice. In fact, it's the only practice, really. You know, we understand things by meeting them, first of all, not skirting around them, but going into them and going through them. And we come out the other side wiser, softer, more loving, and more wise, really. Able to hold other people in their distress as well. So, I think that's plenty. <laughs> And I hope some of that was useful. And uh, let's just sit quietly for a moment. To end.